This video is an excerpt from our SR Lounge premium workshops. To learn more or purchase, simply go to srlounge.com forward slash store. My name is Pi and enjoy the video. Overpowering the sun, part one. If you ever wonder why my titles rhyme, it's because I do it intentionally because it makes me feel good about myself. I'm just saying. Okay, so the number one question I get is how do I get beautiful, vivid colors in the sky? How do I do that? So I thought, let's start this off with a bang. Let's start this off on the right foot and let's just cover this question right from the top. The way that you get vivid colors in the sky is by doing something that we refer to as overpowering the sun. And here's what that means. Let's take a typical scene, okay? This was that shot that we mentioned in Lighting 101 where we shot Jill right on the beach. And we have this beautiful sunset and this is what we'll see with our eyes. We can see Jill and we can see this beautiful sunset and we can see all this great tone and we take the photo and Jill is pitch black, right? Or we expose for Jill and we brighten up the image and then all of a sudden our background goes pure white and we see nothing back there. And we're like, man, this looks so much different. It looks so beautiful when we see with our eyes, but then when we take the photos, it just doesn't look good. This goes back to a concept that we call dynamic range. And the cameras basically have limited dynamic range, meaning they can only capture so much of the tone information in an image. If your subject is in the shadows and you have bright highlights in the scene, your camera can't see both of those. And what we essentially need to do is add light into the shadows to balance them out. So we call this overpowering the sun because what we're trying to do is to get our subjects brighter than the background, to get them brighter than the sun. If for only just a split second when that flash is firing, okay? So that is the goal. And when we can do that, when we can balance that out, then we get a very beautiful image, as you can see here with the shot of Jill. Now in Lighting 101, we showed these techniques where basically here we're bouncing off of a silver reflector and going into Jill, and we get this beautiful, fantastic light and it looks great. And that was with our on-camera flash. With an on-camera 580X2, we just bounced to the left, went right into a silver reflector, threw a specular light right onto Jill, and we were able to overpower the sun. Why? Because there really is no sun, right? The sun is actually set, and we're shooting this at dusk, okay? And that's great. Dusk is kind of the ideal time. When you want to modify a pocket strobe, a small flash, the ideal time to do it is dusk. Why? Because if we did that during the day, you don't have enough power to get to your subject. If we took this exact same shot and I bounced to the left right onto my subjects, you would see absolutely nothing. You would see no light at all. Why? Because this scene is just too bright. So in this type of a scene, when we're shooting midday, when we're shooting sunset, when we're shooting any time during the day, when we want to overpower the sun and we're trying to do it, we're, remember, we're trying to do it with little pocket strobes, right? These guys, little pocket strobes. When we're trying to do with these guys, what do we have to do? We have to use bare bulb flash techniques. And so what we're doing is basically placing the flashes off to camera left. We're firing bare bulb and we'll use one, maybe even two flashes to get enough light onto the subject. Again, that part goes back to inverse square law, where we talked about the distance of the light to the subject in Lighting 101. If the distance of that flash to the subject is closer, we need less flash power. Whereas if the distance is further back, we need a lot more flash power, and that fall off is at a rate that's quicker than you would generally think. So, in this scene, we're using two Fotex Metros pluses. They're at half to full power, and they're stacked side by side next to each other. Now, that's what we essentially need to do to overpower sunlight with just pocket strobes. And we're gonna talk through the settings on this one in just a moment. But I wanna bring up something really important at this time and say that just because you take flashes with you, and this is a mentality that we're all gonna get into, especially when you first start learning about these different tricks and techniques, what ends up happening is you take that gear with you on the shoot, and then because you've taken it and because you have it with you, you feel like you're forced to use it. And what ends up happening is that you give up the good shot for kind of a crappy shot, okay? Because we end up using these techniques just because we have the, the flashes, we end up using them even in situations where we really shouldn't, even when the light is beautiful to begin with. And that's the example that I have right here. In this scene, I took a quick shot, just a silhouetted shot of the couple because I wanted to show this point of how 
just because you brought flash, adding it in a way that's not very good is not going to add to your image. Now, of course, there is a way I could add light to this image where it would look great, but that wasn't the point. What did I do with this one? We placed our flashes in the scene and we fired from, I think, the left side right into them with a Fotex Mitros Plus. And look, basically the same settings, right? 160th, f1.4, ISO 200. And we, we turn our beautiful warm light into this poopy direct flash kind of looking image. So the point being is that just because you have this gear, just because you have the ability to overpower existing light doesn't mean that you should always do it. Okay, we'll talk about that more as we go forward, but I wanted to present that before we dive into how this specific image was shot. So let's start from the top with our process and our tips. We're gonna work through those eight steps and show you how we arrived at this image. Now the first thing that I wanted in this scene was composition and attributes. I wanted depth of field. That was the first thing. When I approached the scene, I'm like, this is an amazing scene. We have a beautiful sky. We have amazing rock detail. We have a sun that would look fantastic in a starburst pattern. And how do you get a starburst? You run the aperture up. You close down the aperture so it makes it really tiny and small, and your lights become starbursts. So at F14, we get that starburst pattern wherever we can see a light source coming in. That's our primary compositional attribute that I wanted to set. Now from there, I simply decide, okay, well, what do I want my shutter speed to be based on the ambient light that I wanna have in this scene? Now remember, if we want a more dramatic image, we cut ambient light down more. If we want a more natural image, we leave ambient light higher. I wanted to go with a little bit more of a dramatic image here, but I didn't want it to be so dark that all of our detail on the rocks down here was clipped, okay? I wanted to see the highlight detail, I wanted to see the water, I wanted to see all that stuff. So at one one hundredth of a second, I got to that balance where I got a beautiful histogram where it showed me I had most of my detail in my shadows. I had all the detail in the highlights. I had the perfect scene set up for a dramatic image. And guess what? Step number two, I've dialed in those two settings and look, one one hundredth of a second is lower than my sync speed of one two hundredth of a second. So I don't need an ND filter and I don't need high speed sync. I can just fire just as is. So my sync is okay. All right, so we just discussed the ambient light exposure. Again, sometimes I kind of do these things out of order because I'm used to it, right? I'm used to like going, okay, uh, compositional effect. Okay, I want, I want depth of field here. Okay, let's see what my shutter speed is and I'll dial my shutter speed first to figure out where I want my ambient light. And then based on that, I'll choose or I'll go to sync and say, okay, do I need to deal with an ND filter or high speed sync in this scene? So it's okay to go out of order every now and then or it's a category out of order if that's just the way that you like to do things. That's totally fine too. Okay, so ambient exposure with F14 combined with 100 of a, a shutter speed and ISO 100, we get a darker ambient light exposure for a more dramatic effect, and that's what we can see here. Light direction and quality. We place the light to camera left. Why? Because our general <laughs> thought process. When we're lighting a couple, it's okay to leave the guy's face a little bit in shadow. Why? Because it's dramatic and with guys, it's okay to have that more dramatic look. In my opinion, in our opinion, it's not okay for the girl to have that more dramatic look. At least it's not preferred. We generally want the girl to have a softer look, to have a more elegant look. And to do that, we want to fill light into her face. So we're firing from camera left and the light's going just where we're aiming it roughly about a foot above their head. So we're raising the light stand so it's slightly above their heads. You always want your light coming from top going down when you want a natural effect to your light. When you want to create unnatural light, that's when you fire bottom up. You create campfire lighting. You create that unnatural look to light. We want a natural look here. So we're firing top down to camera left, which fills directly into her face, gives him a little bit of shadow and, uh, and so forth. Okay, two Fotex Mitros at, let's go ahead and just look right here. So we have, let's see, we stack the multiple flashes. One thing to remember when you stack flashes, you need them to be close together. If they're not close together, and I'm talking about inches, like they need to be right next to each other. A six inch separation in those flashes is gonna create multiple shadows because now you have created two light sources and when those shadows kind of go across and we'll show you, you could actually probably see a little bit of duplication of shadows in this shot if you were to zoom in close and look at it. But we'll show you guys an image with duplicate shadows because the flashes are placed too far from each other. You wanna make sure you look close and avoid that. Keep the flashes close together so that it acts as a singular light source. Okay. 
where are we? We're at our test shot. So what does our test shot do? When we take the first test shot, it actually revealed a shadow on her face. Now you don't see it in this image, but we'll show the image that you see it. It has a shadow right on her side of the face right there. And what's that shadow caused by? It's caused by his face. The back of his head is hitting, the light's hitting the back of his head and casting a shadow right onto her. And it's so small that if I didn't zoom in, I wouldn't have been able to see it, okay? So from that, we just do something very simple. I just ask my subject, open up the shoulder a little bit, okay? Just open up a little bit and then have her kind of turn a little bit. So we just rotate them a little bit so that his shoulder is more open and now that light can just land right on her face without being blocked by his shoulder or his back of his head. Okay, so just take that test shot and adjust the light position or the couple's pose as necessary. Most of the time, I'll start by first adjusting the couple's pose, and if that doesn't work, then we'll adjust the position of the light source. But more often than not, it generally works just to adjust their pose a little bit. Okay, next, once we've taken this shot, I, I really love, you know, I love warm shots like this, and so oftentimes I'll set my white balance up pretty high. This is at 5,500 Kelvin or 5,400 Kelvin, and I'll take the shot because I, I like that look, and it came out warm like this, and it looked beautiful, and I thought, that's, that's perfect. I don't want to change the white balance at all. Okay, then we start posing, framing, and shooting. Now, what do we do here? Well, I take a variety of shots. So we do a couple different poses. I do this shot with them looking at each other. Most of, if you guys do Indian weddings and you shoot Indian couples, a lot of times they do not like to kiss. So we try and refrain from a lot of kissing shots because it's just a cultural thing. So instead of that, I have them basically touch foreheads. I'll still do a couple kissing shots just for my sake, just because I want them, but just know that. So I have them touch foreheads and what I'm doing is I'm shifting angles. So for a couple of shots, I'm shooting down lower and getting more sky. So this top shot is me going lower and getting more sky. This bottom shot is me lifting up a little bit. I'm placing the sun just right about where their faces are. So just right between. Remember we're at F14, so any light source becomes a starburst. And what I wanna do, I wanna create that kind of implied look where it's just God shining down on this relationship of glory. Well, a little more dramatic than uh, it probably actually is, but essentially that's the look we're trying to create. It's just this really dramatic look with the sun coming in and shining on this couple. And I shoot it angled down this time because there's so much beautiful detail in the rocks below and in the reflection casting, uh, you know, the sky colors and everything like that. I thought it looked fantastic. So I shot with both angles. We shot with different compositions, got several different images from this single scene with that same light setup. Again, with every change, okay? So number eight, analyze. As soon as I change that pose and I have them go head to head, you count your bottom dollar, whatever the saying is. I am looking closely at that shot because now that they're close together, I have to make sure that that light source is not being cast and it's not being blocked by anything. And the one thing that I'm worried about is his shoulder right there. His shoulder, if that light position isn't held a little bit higher and brought in a little bit further, his shoulder would totally block the light from her body. And that's what I want to avoid. Okay, so there we go, we got that shot. So, last thing is that tip, just because it's possible to overpower the sun doesn't mean it should be done. And look at that, I rhymed again, and yes, I do feel good about myself because I rhymed again. So don't laugh. But yeah, that's what we talked about earlier. This shot, you know, the, the natural light in a scene can be absolutely gorgeous, and shooting it as a silhouette has so much impact in this type of an image. When we add that light to it, and granted, you know, like when I, when I took this shot, I didn't try and create the same composition, the same everything, and, and you know, get everything perfect. I just wanted to demonstrate a point that a lot of times when we add light, we do the scene a disservice. And just quickly getting that shot kind of proved that, you know. We did the scene a disservice by adding that light, and it really killed our shadows, and it killed everything that made the scene beautiful to begin with. If I was going to add light to this scene intentionally, and to do it in a way that would really add to the scene, it would need to be a very soft amount of directional light that just kissed the side profile of her face. And maybe a soft directional light that would just give his face a little kiss. And the way we'd do that is we'd place a flash, and this is more of a lighting 301 thing that we'll get into later on, but we would need two gridded or snooted flashes, just very soft, place in the back on each side, one to fire kind of softly into his face, one to fire softly into her face, and it creates a subtle profile light just right along the faces and we leave still most everything else in shadow. That's how we would light a scene to retain that kind of look and feel to it. But I wanted to show this to you just as an example of essentially what not to do. Now remember, when it comes to modifying a pocket strobe, and we're gonna give you more demonstrations of this, 
whenever you modify one of these small lights. It's fantastic during, well, let's say dusk when the sun has just set. But if you modify a pocket strobe in the middle of the day, you're not gonna be able to see it. You're losing too much light output to be able to see it. So during the day when you need to overpower the sun with just pocket strobes, think bare bulb, think direct flash, and just shoot it in a way that it doesn't really matter. Like these edges, you know, the kind of more defined shadows on them, we're shooting so wide that it doesn't matter, those types of things. This is an, what we would refer to as an environmental portrait. If I were to zoom in close and take a shot, and it was just a portrait of them close up with this kind of quality of light, it wouldn't look good. But with this angle, it looks fantastic and there's nothing wrong with that. So play to the strengths of the lights that you have. If you don't have a soft light, don't shoot it close up as if it is a soft light, okay? That's it for this tutorial, our step number one on overpowering the sun. Remember that for each one of these tutorials, we're gonna show you just a related pocket strobe gear list where we give you essentially some kind of budget options. These are budget options that we have used and would still recommend, but recommended with some reservations there. And then we give you kind of our favorite options on both the manual and on the full feature pocket strobe side. We're going to do the same thing when we get into medium strobes and so forth. So be sure to look at the gear list. You don't need to buy, of course, everything on that list, just kind of one item from each of the categories as you can see fit. And as you see, you know, how we describe what we're using in each particular scene. That's it for this tutorial. Hopefully you all enjoyed. I know it was a bit of a doozy, but it was our first and they're going to get quicker as we go.